Warning, the following episode contains adult language and screaming goats. Listener discretion is advised. The Pinball Network is online. Launching The Pinball Show. We've got content galore this week on The Pinball Show. Dennis and I give you the goods regarding new info about Stern Pinball's newest release, James Bond 007 Pinball, as well as fresh production updates from Stern. Pricing changes moving forward. The unreleased Elwyn 60th Anniversary Bond Game, a possible future Goldfinger edition. Info on Steve Ritchie's upcoming JJP machine. Cactus Canyon LE production updates. This is Spinal Tap? A Creasel strong take on the 2022 game release catalog. And maybe not the pinball market trends you wanted, but the pinball market trends you need to hear. Hey, if you're headed to the kitchen, I'll take some buttered popcorn as well. Pinball is a game of skill. For some, it's a passion and a lifestyle. It's time for the Pinball Show. It's pinball with personality. Hey, fellow listener. I'm glad you guys clicked the play button this week for the Pinball Show. I'm Zach Many, alongside secret pinball agent himself, Dennis Creasel. You know, Craig Bobby has has like hummed the last two episodes, the James Bond theme. Would you like to hear my James Bond on, on the recorder? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. It's my, Do you really right, have I've, it? I've, I've been pra- I've been practicing so hard. Let me let me let me try here. Wet them lips. Oh, good lord! Oh, oh. there it is. Oh, there we go. Huh. Oh. That's that's harder than it looked. Man, I'm I'm finished. I need a cigarette now. Nice blowing, pushy. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, how are you this week? I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> Let me catch. I gotta catch my breath from all that intensive recording. We call it a song flute. So that's mm-hmm. just an Indiana thing, I believe. I, I guess so, because I ain't never heard that before. In preparation for this episode, I just actually before we started recording watched. Uh, an interview with Pierce Brosnan going over a lot of the major roles he played in his life. And it started, of course, with James Bond. Oh, golden eye. Not, <laughs> not the Bond we're going to be talking about today because Gomez didn't focus on Pierce. But No, we're, we're, talking about, uh, we're talking about Sean Connery. You know, we got a yes. lot of messages, and by a lot, I meant a few, that they really liked my impersonation of a Sean Connery. Really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, I... I thought it was fine. I didn't think anyone would write in about it. But but Dennis, they did say that my impression sounded more like the version of Saturday Night Live. Sean oh, Connery. like the Jeopardy Connery. The Jeopardy, yeah. yeah your mm. mother. <laughs> yeah, that whole, yeah, you know, gushy it up. That pushy. Ah. So what's new? Did you order a bond? I did not. I was told I couldn't have the first pro. Oh. And I'm told the second pro oh. we're going to get to. It's going to be a bit of a wait. But to wait and play and, and maybe see if I can last that long. Speaking of seeing, I uh, I had to get spectacles. Oh my god! I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> uh, you got spectacles. I did. I finally went to the eye doctor after I hadn't been since before the pandemic, and I was noticing the road signs were looking a little blurry, and I'm having more and more trouble reading like subtitling and stuff on the tv so i mm-hmm. went in and i'm like yep you're nearsighted now i used to be farsighted but how does that change i don't know well, it's been 20 years i don't know wow so like yeah it's it's optional if you want to wear them uh i think maybe they're used to dealing with people who are don't like to wear glasses and i'm like just give me the script <laughs> so i can yeah. see see better i'm like oh look how much easier the tv's actually the, i'm only i think i really only talked about the car uh, but, but yeah, actually putting them on, like, cause I play a lot of video games, but I sit pretty far away from the TV and I was like, holy cow, there are labels and I can read them now. Very exciting. I think that a lot of our listeners can attest to that. Um, my mom used to always tell me the more you play with it, you go blind. So mm. maybe that's what's happening there. Mm. Spectacles but, uh, rhymes with something. <laughs> it, uh, I should have just said glasses. 
but then it would have rhymed with asses. What's what's the line on Austin Powers? Spectacles, testicles, wallet, and watch. Oh, when to remember the order of uh, doing the cross on yourself. Oh yeah, spectacles, testicles, wallet, and watch. So you didn't order a James Bond. You did order some bifocals. So that's nice. Nope, just no, those are striving glasses. They're not bifocal. Cheaters. You got some cheaters. Nope, those were for reading. What kind of frames did you get? I don't know what that means. Like uh, the design of the the glasses. I just pointed at two and said those. You didn't have the person pick them for you? I mean, they I they didn't say I looked stupid, so I was like okay. <laughs> Uh, and I've ordered I've ordered a pair of of sun, sunglasses as well. Those will be aviators. Those are my I gotta ooh. gotta pull the Biden style. I always like aviators for for sunglasses. You gotta roll just like goose, baby. I'm gonna, oh no, I'm gonna hit my head on the canopy. Mm, oh, poor goose. <laughs> we got a lot to talk about this week, Dennis. A shitload to talk about. Such as <laughs> last week, we didn't have an episode on the pinball show because we had a you brand did. We had a brand new podcast enter the TPN channel. That you is, did, and of course, you had to put yourself on it first. I did. I was asked. Contamination. You know, I got to give the people what they want, and the people wanted me. And boy, oh boy, numbers don't lie. Whew. We, I saw another pinball podcaster complaining and saying that the pinball party is over before it started. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's kind of mean. Like, you haven't seen the fucking numbers then? Because <laughs> that's it's doing very well. Numbers, as they say, don't lie. Zach. No, they don't. Not on that one. Especially whenever the numbers of the new guy surpass that three to four times that of this uh, five year of this podcasters. very show. Yeah. 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 Uh, wait, no. Uh, no. 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 <laughs> Imagine what your numbers could be with Greg Bone, though. Maybe higher, maybe lower. Maybe. Why is he so popular? I don't know. They can't see him on the podcast, so the looks difference, like, I, I can't lose when that's not in play. He was a little pistol this weekend. I was <laughs> I was trying to watch Rings of Power this last weekend. Mm, one one evening, pieces. I was, I've been, was slammed on launch day for Bond and Stern. Uh, I so finally slammed. get a chance to sit down at 11 o'clock at night, and I'm, I get messages Bing, 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 bing. I'm like, well, I guess Elwin 60th is out now. I need to go back downstairs and start taking over for that. <laughs> uh, but no, everybody's like, oh, shit, Greg Bone is fired up. Oh, damn, he is going off. Oh, and I was like, oh, no, what's going on now? He was feisty. He got a little feisty. Mm. Yeah. Never put Boney in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> he's, the, he's, the, he's the buffalo sauce chicken wing. He is, man. He's got some kick. He doesn't say much until it's that time, and then he's got some kick. You know who else has kick? Mm. <laughs> Donkey. <laughs> Donkey. Onion layers. It's Craig Bobby. Oh. Or, as we now call him at TPN, Bobby Bond. Is he going to do the, gonna do the theme hope- a yeah, third time? People want it. <laughs> People want two things this last week in pinball, listener, and that is a little Bobby Bond and Return of the Wamp. People want <laughs> yes, give us our wamps back. <laughs> Shoot the wamp. Shoot the wamp. They got rid of it, mostly. Did they? Yeah, I heard it. I actually heard it. I did have it come up, but only one time. Was the voice actor dejected? Was he like, He's Shoot like, the wamp? Shoot the wamp, I guess. If you want to. <laughs> Jerry, why don't you just replace me with a Japanese voice actor for all of it? I think that uh, was the whole line. Oh, my gosh. Uh, the last thing, and then we'll jump to Craig Bobby. I don't know if anybody realized this, but my mind is oftentimes in the gutter, listener. I was watching the stream they did. They did the talk stream this last week, the first impressions of James Bond with Joel Engelberth, Craig Bobby, Hottie from Frisco Pinball, and a very sleepy David Dennis. And the, it, it was brought up his ability to do this, the the theme song with his tongue, a, a tongue thing, a vibrato, like, like he can do that. And Joel, sweet, innocent Joel, just comes out of nowhere and is like, I bet you make your wife proud. And he was meaning it as like. <laughs> like, like proud of that. He, yeah, could, like, that oh, he has such v- my vocal husband range. Can do but the James no. Bond thing. But oh, the way Joel. he said it. Oh, Joel. Oh, oh, wow. So young, innocent Joel. Wow. And I bet Mrs. Bobby is very happy. <laughs> is very happy. <laughs> See what you got, Craig. <laughs> Catch you on the lick side. <laughs> What? It's probably why he's so fucking good at it. <laughs> I've been waiting years for this. Oh, my tongue is as mighty as a sword. <laughs> <laughs> Bond. 
James Bond. Hello and welcome to the Pinball Show's Top Stories. I'm Craig Bobby. Well, my God, we're finally here. After literally months and months of intense speculation and years of rumor mongering on the possibility of a James Bond themed machine, we finally saw what all the fuss was about. Stern, after a cancelled official launch followed by an avalanche of leaked information details, we now have the official videos and website unveiling this past week of the George Gomez designed Stern Pinball Master. Masterpiece, James Bond. Now, as the rumors already told us, the game is based on the Sean Connery era of the Bond franchise, but with each Pro, Premium, and LE trim levels, each themed artistically around a different Connery era Bond movie. The Pro is based on Dr. No, the Premium based on You Only Live Twice, and the LE based on the Bond classic Thunderball. Oh, and let's not forget a yet to be released, completely redesigned Keith Elwin 60th Anniversary Edition featuring a single level machine that incorporates incorporates all 25 Bond films. Is anyone's heart beating faster yet? Now Stern's departure and their art package theming generally hasn't, to my knowledge, been done before, which ultimately served up to stir tons of confusion on the rumor front, as folks just couldn't get their head around this idea, as people generally thought the game would be based solely on one film or another. Of course, beyond George Gomez taking the lead design role, Stern deployed Mike Vinicor, this time on rules design, with assistance from Lonnie Rop on code. John Rothermel took lead mechanical engineer with some assistance from Tom Capera. Jerry Thompson, of course, is on sound design with Chuck Ernst on animations. And for that all-important art package, we had famed artist Kevin O'Connor, last seen for his artwork both on the Kiss Machines by Bally in 1979 and the Stern Kiss in 2015. Who, as George Gomez praises in his recent interview with Nate Shivers on the Stern's in-house podcast available to all access subscribers had to methodically take images from Bond movie posters and film art library to repaint, touch up, or correct much of it so that Stern could use these retro images on these modern machines. Now I'll let Zach and Dennis go over all the interesting shots, layouts, and mechs that this exciting new release offers in its various trim levels and incarnations. However, I think when you stand back and look at what Stern has offered up, we can easily come to this conclusion. This Gomez design machine is definitely not your slapdash, throw some mechs and designs in a ring and then cut three quarters of them out due to an inflated cost and overrun build of materials. As usual with Gomez designs, there is a thoughtfulness, level of detail and caring here that we frankly just don't see enough in today's modern pinball era and something that many fans and collectors in the hobby have been clamoring and crying out for with each passing new release in the last five years. Yes, gone now were the cries for more mechs, better art and better layouts as this machine is mech heavy with a fresh and exciting Gomez layout and beautifully vibrant Bond movie themed art. But let's not forget that nothing is for free and that everything comes at a price. And in this case, the price paid in Stern's James Bond is literally the selling price of of these new machines. Yes, those cries for we need more have been replaced now with fears from potential buyers about continual, some might say aggressive price hikes as Stern dares customers to put their money where their mouth is and give buyers more, but once again, also charge significantly more for it. Now Stern chose to modestly raise prices by $100 on the Pro Machine, the mainstay of most operators and price conscious buyers. If you call paying nearly $7,000 US for a pinball machine as price conscious, but this strategy keeps machines in theory being placed in the wild which keeps the Stern name visible and their operator owners happy. Instead, Stern chose to go where the real money now sits, in the coveted affluent collector and home buyer market who seem only too happy to continue to pay more for their beloved machines if 
there is a real or perceived perception that they are in fact getting more with a bond premium now $700 more to $96.99 US and the LE limited to 1,000 units going up another $1,900 to $12,999. Ooh, I love gold. But the most intriguing thing behind the bond release is that Stern chose to go further out on a limb and offer its customers the chance to buy an even more exclusive but completely redesigned machine for Bond's 60th anniversary celebration. Unlike what Stern did for the 40th edition of the Elvira machine that was basically just repainted and came with some additional collector swag items, the 60th anniversary James Bond machine has been confirmed by Gomez to be designed from scratch by none other than the greatest of all time, Mr. Keith Elwin himself. Rumored to have no set retail price by Stern for its distributors, Stern will once again allow market pricing to rule and give distributors another chance to make bank on a very limited number, 500, 60th anniversary James Bond machines. George's recent interview on the Stern All Access podcast confirms that the now-leaked images of the Elwin 60th anniversary machine, if not 75% accurate, does a pretty good job of outlining what we might expect to see, with those images leaving out key mechs like the scoring reel or cabinet design features. Yes, you heard right, the Elwin single-level playfield game has actual mechanical scoring reels in the back box, programmed by Mark Paneko, who used to work at Williams Pinball back in the day and came over to Stern in 2021. Stern will deploy a small video display from their home pin edition on the playfield to display animations, movie clips, and game information. The game also contains every actor who ever played James Bond as well as new mechs not seen on any of the Gomez designs. Wow! Could we be looking at the game of the year here in James Bond? Well, when matched against rivals this year in John Borg's Rush and Pat Lawler's Toy Story 4 as previous frontrunners, theme aside, I think this George Gomez designed James Bond certainly edges out those titles in design and theming. But with many question marks still looming about what we might see from the Elwin 60th anniversary machine and still to come any live James Bond gameplay from Stern, you guessed it, we shall have to wait and see. From the Pinball Show, I'm Craig Bobby. Gong, 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 gong. Catch you on the flip side. Bond. James Bond. That Craig Bobby's good. He's great. What would we do? I'm trying to think the next game that's rumored to come out. I'm hoping he can do something with his tongue to that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Godfather. <laughs> it won't be as fun, but oh, shit. we'll get that triple Spain cannoli on. I just can't wait to hear that original theme song for GTF. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I hope I hope they got Craig to do the laser sounds of the tanks firing. Pew 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 <laughs> pew pew pew. pew. <laughs> Dennis, all last week I've been receiving messages. Everybody wants to hear what our take is on the reveal, the launch, the game, everything that is Stern Pinball's James Bond 007. Released last Thursday, this is a George Gomez design. Lonnie Ropp and Mike Vinicor on the rules. A little hard to find who was on the rules there for a while. Yeah, I I don't understand it. I, I only picked up on it actually in the transcript of the Gomez interview on the Stern Insider okay. podcast. And I think the last time those two worked together was on Stranger Things. Yes. Yes, I believe that is accurate. But I will argue that those expecting a very similar style of rule set or code, keep in mind that by trade, Brian Eddy was a software engineer and rules guy. So I think Brian Eddy probably contributed quite a bit just knowing the Attack from Mars rules and the the medieval rules, very similar uh, to to Stranger Things. So I don't know if we'll get, I don't know what we're going to get, but... uh, I certainly think Brian Eddy played a role on Stranger Things more than some people think. Artwork by Frank McCarthy, Robert McGinnis, and Kevin Adam. Now, these individuals, I think, are Bond artists. This isn't a pinball. We're not pulling these from pinball. These were sketches and artwork that's made famous from movie posters uh, from the the six Bond Connery films. And I I think, don't quote me on this, listener, but I think Kevin O'Connor at Stern Pinball helped kind of pull it all together for pinball. This is a Cornerstone release, so we've seen a Pro, a Premium, and LE limited to uh, 1,000 units. Plus, in a bit, we will talk about an upcoming 60th anniversary limited edition game by Keith Elwin. 
that's coming out soon. So many models. So we got three of the standard Cornerstone models. There's new pricing now. Stern has increased pricing. The pros, that is, the Dr. No Pro version of James Bond, now sixty nine ninety nine mm MSRP, mm, which uh which, hundred bucks. Yeah, went up a hundred bucks. So not bad. Everybody's like, no okay, less than I right. thought it would. Okay. The premium went up seven hundred dollars. MSRP is now ninety six ninety nine. The premium features the you only live twice uh, film art package. And then the limited edition model based around the Thunderball theme, thirteen nine ninety nine MSRP. That went up significantly. Mm, was yes, it nineteen hundred dollars versus the Rush Ellie twenty five hundred if Oof. you care about the comparison to Godzilla Ellie. Okay, so significantly, and they're still keeping that one thousand unit alive and well. Yes, it's a three flipper game. We haven't seen that from George Gomez since his initial design in Corvette, Valley Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's only two pops in this game. Hmm. I, I've been looking at diagrams of it. I, I don't see a third pop unless it's hiding. No, they, you know, I've noticed lately Stern has been willing to deviate mm -hmm. and allow the non rule of the, the three nested pops. Yeah. And they might have like a sling pop to mimic a third pop, but I don't know if that's in here or not. But yeah. Game features all six films that featured Sean Connery. There are in the game Q gadgets, Spectre weapons, villains, henchmen, Bond women, even Pushy Galore. Carefully integrated speech from all six Connery Bond films and the James Bond theme by John Barry, as well as other film theme songs. I don't know if people know that. It's all I in didn't. there. It's all in there. Ooh. I like how you said carefully integrated speech. Not like that sort of slapdash style we're <laughs> used to. Oh, Bobby, Bobo. <laughs> Shoot the whamps. <laughs> well, but, I just, but I just shot the scoop. So what are the differences between these models? A quick rundown here. All models are going to feature the Spectre Bird 1 rocket base. <laughs> I thought a different joke was coming. No. Nope. All models also feature the custom-molded Aston Martin DB5 with ejector seat. Beer bunk. Goose no. <laughs> People were asking, is that flap going to hold up? It'll hold up. All models feature a right post in-lane to stage modes. Kind of like Keith Elwin likes to do instead of scoops. All mm, models. But he often favors the left in-lane. Yes, he does. All models have the Thunderball eject from the left side of the play field, almost like the... Almost like the stage, the locked ball in Elvira House of Horror shoots it back up mm. towards the, the target or the pops. Shunk. All models feature diamonds are forever. Opto spinner. Ooh, opto spinner. Yeah. Clink, 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 Not only clink, that, clink. did you see the glitter on that spinner? So shiny and crow. See, I care about those little details. Sparkly. You do. There's nothing better than a sparkly spinner. All models feature a special bond, what they call assignments, that are only possible with connectivity, which is coming soon. Oh, it'll be interesting to learn what that is. Sounds like modes. Mm-hmm. The premium LE stands out from the Pro with a couple of different features, one being what uh, the enthusiasts are calling Bond on a Wand. I do love that name. I do, too. Whoever is credited for that, sorry for, for not knowing. You're anyone, a wizard, Jamesy. That's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. So the Thank Bond, you. is it's like a moving jetpack figure that carries the ball and uh, the now this is information I have not heard out there, but Gary and Seth did tell us dealers the player or game can actuate at times this uh, this mechanism. Okay. So maybe the game is programmed to pick it up and drop it, but maybe just maybe, and I don't know yet. We haven't seen a stream or gameplay. Maybe the player can hit that action button to drop the ball where they want. Or maybe why not both? <gasps> why not both? Gary and Seth also indicated that the moving jetpack figure, you can hit the dragon tank target. There's two targets on the dragon tank. Or they said in their seminar, or lock balls start multi balls. Hmm. Now, this can be one of two things, Dennis. This can mean just by default, when a ball gets diverted up there and bond wand, <laughs> bond wand, <laughs> when bond wand picks it up, that is the initiation of a virtual lock. Or. Maybe you can drag it all the way over to that wire form. I don't know. To lock a ball. Because if you get it to that wire form and drop it, you technically would get it into the uh, the physical ball lock. Yeah, I'm... I don't no, know if I it don't. reaches, but... Maybe. It's just interesting a, that, that they be, said they I can lock I won't balls. say that's an odd decision, but it does remind me of like Demolition Man where everyone only chooses the ball lock the crane, in that case. Yeah. Like, I... Yeah. Anyway, that's a rules question. So I don't... I don't... It just... I, I saw them talking about it, and I was like, that's interesting. The Premium LE also showcases a stainless steel Bird 1 gantry with the diverter. So it's like a big building in the back by the missile. 
uh, which has a spiral ramp and a three ball physical lock. We like that. The premium LE also features a Thunderball reverse eject scoop with hidden custom sculpt James Bond and Spectre Diver figures. Think Creature from the Black Lagoon on Monster Bash. It's like a clear window, and then whenever you hit it, it lights up, and you can see something underneath, and they're fighting down there in their scuba gear. Premium LE also has a custom molded Dr. Nose Dragon tank with internal illumination. It's got a flasher inside. The LE also has the traditional LE aesthetics and upgrades, most notably the teal Thunderball trim package that we'll talk about and a mirrored back glass, clear glass, shaker motor, better speakers, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, your usual, your usual LE fare. So let's talk about this game. Mm. Let's talk about what I'm calling tagline failure to launch. Isn't that a Matthew McConaughey movie? All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Be a lot cooler uh. if it was. When will Matthew get his pin? Would you buy a failure to launch pinball machine? I've never seen the movie. Oh. So, I mean, if it plays well, yeah, but I wouldn't buy it off theme. That's a damn shame. Isn't it to, pushy? I, like, I've seen Mud. Like, I've, I've seen, seen Mud. McCon- I've Lincoln seen Lawyer? McConaughey and Mud. I've Lincoln seen Lawyer Interstellar, too. where the sound balance is so bad. Well, fuck off, dude. The, the Interstellar, says. we're not doing that, because Interstellar is the best sci-fi film of all time. I don't want to hear it. All you nutty Event Horizon 2001 space. I, fuck it. No. It is no one picks 2000. 2001 is what people like who are trying to pretend to be pretentious Ooh. and no stuff. It's a slow film. No one cares. Well, get them, Rosebud. Event Horizon is awesome. <laughs> Have you ever seen Fire in Zero G? Yeah, it's I, beautiful. Yeah, go back to Jurassic Mama Park. Bear, open the oh, door. God. No, Mama. it's it's interstellar. <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need eyes to see. Really stellar. And I wished I didn't have eyes to see how this launch had gone. It was messy. This is, you know, I've had, you know, I got like, I've got my, my Fixian level of tenure. I've been in the hobby. I've I mathed it since by, if we count it from when I bought my first pen, I've been in over 10 years now. Watercoloring. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I have never seen Stern have such a bad launch which in my makes entire me, time. I agree. Which makes me think that it was something out of their hands. Uh, I'm going to say partially. Okay. There's got to be there's some culpability that falls within Absolutely. the corporate level. Absolutely. Uh, and and it was from I mean, I don't know, I don't know how to approach it from announcing a launch date and then changing it, but not changing it immediately. And when I say immediately, what I mean is it's all well and good and I understand that it's a it's a UK license and so with the death of the queen, I I get it, but also they it felt like they dragged their feet on making that determination. Like, why is the game already at the show getting set up for the show? The queen had been deceased for, I think over 48 hours before they made the determination. Sure, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, then they changed it again. They pushed it two more days back. Mm-hmm. So that stuff, at least in part falls on Stern. But I don't then blame they moved Stern it to the for following the weird. Week. Yeah. But and, and so it's like, it's super, it's super pushed. Then, uh, where it's not their fault, but you know it doesn't help. Is the 007 store then ends up leaking all the photos, probably was, because they had their website scheduled to do the you know to post all the pages. And this was after the leaks that came from that convention. And yes, someone said they got upset, and or the licensor got upset. I yeah, I heard, I heard the licensor got really upset about that, and, and they okay, pulled them so off the floor. A, a, right. So that's the that's and again that's the, you know that's a that's a partial. Obviously, Stern didn't leak that, but. They knew they that knew control was, was lost the moment the games left the factory. Like they, you don't have control anymore. Once they decided they go. to go over there knowing the queen had passed. Yes, that's the thing that's so strange to me. Even if they had pre-shipped the games, they still chose to you know plan to get them ready. Whenever the queen had passed, they had to have called the licensor and said, "Hey, this this is might get a little messy. How do you want us to? Do you still want us to go to this convention? What what are you guys? What are your thoughts out there?" It's like, okay, so they didn't do the release because of the Queen. They still ran their show at the UK sure. IAPA, though. I, you it's know, a head scratcher. But, but I'm not, you know, I'm not English. I don't, I, like, there were a whole lot of weird, I, I saw some stuff online about just, like, the inconsistency on things. So, like, like cricket matches got to keep going, but they suspended all of the soccer matches. <laughs> Interesting. I heard that one of their major convenience stores, in respect for the Queen, like, turned down the beep sounds. I don't know if that was the of the doors or the, the checkout lanes, and when you swipe stuff, like they they reduce like is that like a flag? They is didn't mute them; they just masked. turned them down. It's like <laughs> I don't get it. It's so weird to me. All of this makes no sense. It to was me. it was strange. It was very strange. And then we had to wait an additional week 
with grainy photos out there. And yes. Then, like you and, said. And whilst, I'm going to use the word whilst. Wow. In, in respect for the queen. Wow. Whilst all of this was happening and we have the grainy you know, photos, the potato cam style stuff floating around. Then the information leaks out about the Elwyn game. Oh, that's right. There's an additional game, which at that point in time, this information, I don't think dealers had their seminar yet because we had it the day of. No, you hadn't had your seminar yet. So we were like, is this true? And if so, are we going to be able to see this prior to people going in for an LX? That wouldn't be right. And so, I mean, it was just, there were multiple misses on multiple fronts. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm not being facetious. It is, as long as I've been around, the worst reveal, Stern. I've seen worse reveals, but this is the worst I've ever seen from them. Yeah, usually they, uh, usually they have their shit in order when it comes to. I, I mean, if, if I were, if I was just me, if I were Stern Management, uh, marketing would have gotten a talking to about this. I mean, you have. It's just so hard to know who's. Maybe it wasn't even a marketing. Who knows? I don't know. Who I knows? don't know. But it's a company that relies on its reveals. I mean, this isn't like just you know screwing up a social media post. This it's a big deal when you do a launch. This felt. Very, very bungled. People know that myself, uh, Greg, we've helped with some launches of games in the past for different manufacturers. So I've got a lot of questions asked to me this last week, Dennis. Like, you know, if you've done consultation in the past, does this hurt sales? Does this affect a company's ability to sell games whenever you, you flop a release and you flop it again? And then you can't take orders. And I told everybody the same thing. And then especially now, retrospectively, this game is a certified hit already. It is selling like fucking bananas. It is, right. It and is so, selling. And given that, especially now that well. we 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 have numbers, I yes. mean, we we've been hearing from a variety of distributors about the sales. So it's selling so, great, but so yeah, it's like it's like yeah, it's a it was a it was a terrible launch, quite frankly. But this is pinball. It's not like a lot of other industries where there's not really a lot of competition against them anyway. Mm-hmm. So. It it was it still worked out. So I guess, you know, ultimately maybe Stern could probably shrug and say, Does it really matter if our launches are bad? Does it really matter if it looks amateurish? They can, but ultimately what I've responded to these people was was this. Sure, it it is, you know, hindsight is selling great, so does it ultimately matter? But I will say objectively, this is when this happens, it does objectively affect sales. Period dot. They could have sold more had this reveal been better. And I really firmly stand behind that because from a sales marketing standpoint, whenever a potential consumer first, quote unquote, experiences a game in in this respect for pinball, it's usually a visual thing. Once they see pictures, you are at the highest peak and probability of making that sale, that immediate, Mm. uh, that immediate Uh, emotional reaction. immediate. And the hype yes. is immediate upon visual reveal. Absolutely. Uh, and then after that, it only degrades. Yes. Every second, every minute, every hour, day, week, month, it will continue to go down no matter what. So, yes, I objectively think that it did affect sales. Now, grand scheme of things, is it a big deal? Maybe not. But it, they can't say that it didn't affect the potential sales of this product. It did. But having said that, mm-hmm. what do we think about this game? Let's, we think a lot of things, Zach. Let's jump in things. pretty quick on some of these takes. Your first impressions when you first saw the grainy photos. What was your eye turned to first? Was it art? Was it Max? Was it, uh, oh, it is James Bond and Sean Connor? What were your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, the first thing I, I'd say I noticed was the trans lights and cabinet art. Mm-hmm. Old style. Yes. Very release That's- movie poster esque. Yes. My my initial Very thought yellow. <laughs> my initial thought was um strict license. Actually, no, my initial thought was woof. But oh. my next thought was <laughs> a follow up thought. Was I bet the licensor is extremely strict about what you can use in terms of assets. That was my take too. Yep. Fitting, I also thought after after that. So now I've got two afterthoughts that this would have been an assigned Steve Ritchie game because when he was at Stern, he always got he the unreasonable the, art package. Yeah, the crap art. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He always got. And we don't mean Johnny crap. We mean bad, bad art. He's like, you always got the str- the stringent. You're gonna use what we use on the lunch boxes, and that's that. And I'm like, wow, I poor I poor guy. I, yeah. I was like, other than Black Knight, it was like everything was just like 
<laughs> terribly mm-hmm. strict. And this feels exactly the same. Like, I do not like any of these art packages. Oh, strong take. I just don't. Now, don't. I don't buy games based off the art. So ultimately, that doesn't matter much to me. But but seeing that, and before I noticed the mechs, it was the same thing with with the play field. And it's like, they're just floating heads everywhere. There are faces it, everywhere on faces, that art package. Faces the upon field. faces. And it looks, it the game... The game art package is not, it is not attractive. I don't think. I think it is objectively not attractive. It reminds me of the Photoshop era. And I think a lot of people, when they saw these things, especially the Translight and Cabinet art, were wishing for that. I think he took it down, but Christopher Franchi had a mock up that he did at one point. Yeah, and it's so that. much better. It's I've so much better. Seen that. Franchi always does that. <laughs> He's always like, look what you Yeah, but this was like had. years ago. Uh, he did, he, but, but but people still people saved it because they do they learn people take stuff down off yeah. of Facebook so so people saved it and I had people they they were passing it around because they're like look at how much better it looked damn good it did. I mean it did it, it did, did. It, uh, it's just I mean I wished I would have wished for his art over the but again based off of you know even what he had noted in the post at the time I don't think the licensor would have approved it yeah, that's true I, for me personally whenever I seen this the first time. My gut instant or my gut reaction and emotion was this art does leave a lot to be desired. There's nothing that I would call beautiful on the cabinet, on the back glass, on the play field. It was a miss for me personally, but art is subjective. I did not, nor do I think this is a beautiful artwork. And I think you talked about it being fitting, and I'll give it that. I'm going to give the left cabinet that the Thunderbirds. A premium left cabinet i'm going to give surprisingly <laughs> like you said thunderbirds <laughs> surprisingly i think the back glasses are very bold that was a risky move and i do love them composition wise i love that it is if you know bond it's bond doctor no if you know bond it is you only live twice i do love that bold move i love that i don't like the faces on the play field and what just really cuts me to the core is seeing an art package on the right side of that cabinet that mimics some of my worst work in pinball promotion. <laughs> it, it is Microsoft Paint posters mm. that have no reasoning. The layout is horrible. The, the negative space is bad. It, does, it just breaks up the entire storyline of the rest of the art package. I don't get it yeah leave it for the 60th i don't understand it i i get that i uh, another thing for me uh was i just think it's odd that i know it's more and more homeowner dominated but there's still a sizable operator market and for the the back glass slash trans lights to not say james bond or 007 anywhere on them i think is extremely weird from a business standpoint Uh, marketing i agree and I, I get that they have it on the front of the beneath the coin door. No one looks at that. No one sees that in an arcade. And the same with the sides of the back box. They're often in rows. So a lot of people, I'm just thinking if you're like got a bunch of hipsters at a bar and they never saw these movies, they're not going to know what Dr. No is. Well, so, if it's a bunch of hipsters at a bar, let's be fair. They probably shouldn't watch these films. <laughs> Well, that's, but that's not the point. The point is they might know James Bond because of Daniel Craig. Yes. So saying that this is about James Bond might mean something. But when you look, unless you know the movies, this doesn't tell you that. You have mm-hmm. to actually go up to the game. I just thought it was an odd – again, odd it is what it is. It's just – I think it was just – it was odd. I and just I found a lot about it odd, and again, it just feels to me like it was just restrictive. I like the bold choice. Why. I think it was an artistic choice, mm-hmm. and I think that that helps that package personally. I, but from a sales standpoint, yeah, I and agree. and separate from like critiquing the design of the art itself, and all right, so they went with the posters. I, I get it. I get it. It's an interesting idea. Not my style. Whatever. Uh, no Goldfinger art package. Weird mm. choice. Most popular Connery movie. I I just don't get it. Doctor No is is it's a fairly well rated movie on on Rotten Tomatoes. There's only one uh, explanation but, for that. I mean, come on. Yeah, there's, I, there's, that would be my inclination yeah. too. But again, it's like there's a know. reason that Thunderball was the Ali and Doctor right, No right. was Thunderball the would be the second would have been my second rank mm-hmm. on and be like Goldfinger and Thunderball are the two most popular ones. And then after that, you know, I guess kind of whatever. Mm-hmm. Welcome to Elvira's 40th anniversary coming out. <sighs> 2020. I wonder, you know, I guess it doesn't really matter, but it kind of feels like people might get mad about that if they were like, do you want to buy Thunderball with 
you had the money and you really wanted Goldfinger and then you feel like they bait and switched you later? I don't know. People only get angry if the machine is no good. Elvira people ate that damn thing up. So I think it'll be fine. But yeah, okay. I, I could almost bet we're going to see a, a small 250, 500 run of a Goldfinger, even if they call it a premium edition or a studio release. Later or the on. Lucy edition of, we'll, we'll <laughs> of Bond. It. We'll get it. I, look, the Thunderball. I kind of do like that cabinet art though, with the scuba diving. Thunderball that, wasn't a bad Thunderball wasn't a bad pick. You only lived twice. Good. I thought was weird, uh, the, but I yeah. also thought they picked Doctor No for the pro to try and force people into the premiums at least. <laughs> so it's what, so what do yellow. I, I actually like that. There's lots of yellow. I had a silver slugger, so I'll, I respect the fact that they're like, let's just do a bunch of yellow. Well, it's showcasing um, the Bond girls too. I mean. You know. Yeah, you know, I but again, I know someone who is a you and I both know them, huge Bond fan, has been very tempted about getting the pro, but mm-hmm. uh in the he, he's got a family and he's he and his wife have been talking about that they're not super comfortable with the side of that cabinet. Really? Aren't uh, they in bathing and, suits? And having aren't it they? in their house and Are they in bathing suits? I thought they were I don't know. Yeah, but I mean it's a sort of a the poses are suggestive. Again, it's straight I from see. the poster. Okay, but yeah. The poster was of an era and they, you know, with young girls in the house, they, that wasn't a message they were really keen on sending and the other art packages they don't find as offensive, but they yeah. find the price a bit of a problem. That's so, offensive. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I didn't, I didn't want to Does the, does George Gomez's designed offend? No. What do you think about the design the layout? The geometry? I think a lot of people, uh, I, people are eating it up. Yes. Yeah. They're I, fucking eating I mean, it up. We haven't seen, as you noted, other than his. His freshman effort, we haven't seen a three flipper from Gomez. So I think that alone just feels like it, it reminds me of when people so badly wanted Stranger Things and Mandalorian mm-hmm. from Eddie to kind of feel like uh, shadow, a pull yeah. from the shadow. And this is like, here you go. We've got some, you know, and there's some elements here that's kind of like NBA fast break. Obviously, the third flipper gives you like this Corvette feel. So. I think a lot of people are just really excited that it. we don't see Gomez design much anymore. And now he's definitely gone away from where he had been for so long, so many fan layouts uh, or or other just sort of two two flipper configurations. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I don't believe that they're all fans. But mm-hmm. but, um, good argument. but this ain't no fan. No this, one's going to think this is a fan. This is no fan. And I'm starting to see the stock on George Gomez over the last couple of years really rise up, especially – after uh, Deadpool and what people have come to love in Batman 66, it feels like we've got Gomez here, very Elwin-esque, that they're going to get a following and a good sales push regardless of what they do from here on out. So he's hit that special kind of epsilon uh, level to me where I don't know if he could have messed this up with how much he's been giving to the industry and everybody's loving him. He's got that cult following, if you will. So I see this layout and it looks different. It does. Like you said, I I, I see elements of him in it, which is what you expect from any veteran designer, Mm -hmm. but they have certain things, but it's definitely, I mean, with that third flipper and there's more than one shot accessible with it. Gary, uh, I will say this not to interject, but Gary Stern, Seth Davis said during the seminar, there are four shots from that third flipper. Now, I don't know if that's going to be like a Led Zeppelin middle ramp okay. <laughs> third shot. I, I mean, I, I see shots. three in the photos, at least of the photo of the pro, for okay. sure. I see three. I was saying on Pinball Party uh, here on TPN, go listen to it. Bink. Gomez always seems to have some of the most genius geometry and flow and kinetic satisfaction. But damned if, and I love my homie Gomez, but there's always seems to be one shot that is just straight poo. On a Gomez game. Yeah, I heard you say that. And I think I think I, I called it the poo shot. Well, it's got some validity behind that. Look at all his past. There's always one shot. And I worry that that side flipper straight up to the ramp <laughs> is going to be that oh, shot. Oh, you think it's the ramp? I thought maybe you were going to think it was the shot into the pops just above it. Well, yeah, but that's... Well, yeah, I wouldn't want to ever shoot straight into the pops from a right flipper or from an upper flipper. But no, it's just the, the angle. You're going straight into a a stainless or you're going straight into a metal guide. And uh-huh. I just, I don't know how satisfying that's going to be. No diverter there that gives you that arch geometry, just bam. And then comes back around. It just, it worries me. It's like a Lord of the Rings, right cabinet, right ramp shot. Mm. But that's the only one I have problems with. Everything else looks fun as shit, man. It looks different. We've got drops that are, that are right in front of the, the missile surrounding 
And you got that bobbling around like uh, yeah. Why does it bob? Why does it vibrate? <laughs> Zach, why does it vibrate? I don't. Does it know. vibrate on the Pro as well? I a lot of our buyers are just you know generally male, but I've had a lot of the buyers reach out and say, "Man, for some reason, my wife is really getting behind this game." <laughs> Well, you know, it uh, bobbles. Missiles bobble. I haven't seen the film. I don't know. What does it do? It's been so long since I've seen it. I can't I can't comment. I like the idea of it. I like the idea that the ball can bounce off of an object and hit targets that you need to complete the spell. I think Spectre. I like that. The ramps area is cool. I, I kind of think it's funky that little, uh, how you have to shoot in between the, the two right ramps to do the orbit. I kind of like that. Little Vuck shot. People are getting behind this because it's different. And everybody wants different right now. And it's George. Oh, well, yeah. Does. It's been working for Elwin. So the design, I think, is uh, the design is a good, good thing. So with me, the mechs as well. Yeah. I People are yeah, saying that no, this it, has got more in it than Toy Story and JJP used to be known for filling up their mm, games. Well, it is a different manufacturer. And they say, what, what is up with Stern leading the industry on on mechs and features you got godzilla that feels loaded down now you've got this that feels loaded down and a pro frankly that still has a lot in it the ejector seat it's you know it still has a lot of a lot of stuff in it do you think the mechs are a central feature of this game what, what do you think out of these categories we don't know the code yet do you think it's the layout or do you think it's the mechs which one do you think is going to be the, the highest rated by people well, I normally would say the layout just because that's what you ultimately play, but it's hard to divorce that from the mechs That's because the mechs are, yeah. are a key part of the, uh, here's the, based off of some discussions from, from folks, I, I'm going to go, I'll stick with layout. And the reason is there are a lot of people that look at this. And as you noted, they look at the pro and they seem pretty comfortable with the idea of getting the pro that it has enough mechs in it. Mm-hmm that they would rather not pay the additional price on the premium, especially given the difference on the markups versus rush. Uh, yes, and really so that's point. telling me that the, the mechs that they were able to cost into the pro are sufficient that people feel there's value there. That's good analysis. Yeah. But that could also make you ask yourself whether or not that meant that the mechs aren't interesting enough to justify the upcharge mm-hmm. into the premium, you know, with the, to go back to Godzilla, because I'm more familiar with it, obviously, you have that nice building drop that was only available on Premium LE. Mm. And I think the thing is... Tummy grab. Is bo- <laughs> right. But, and tummy grab. Yeah, I got tummy grab with the, with the, and the rotating band. I mean, I, I, I don't... People need to listen to me talk about Godzilla because they know my feelings yes. on it already. Yes. But I think Bond on a Wand, mechanically, very, very interesting. Think... People are also getting rescue nine one one vibes though. It was a How huge flow not? killer. Uh, you know things that are that move the ball like that are very slow. They are and going around and then just dropping it on one of two vertical targets doesn't. On paper, that doesn't sound like it's as much fun as the amount of real estate. I thought it takes. one of the targets might have a magnet. I was like, that could be cool. Oh, just, visually, I think it's going to be incredibly awesome. It's no, you just, know what I mean though. Like if it dropped onto a magnet like, and then the magnet held it there, I was like, that mm-hmm. that could be pretty cool but i don't know if it I has could that. but i don't Just again target as the gap widens see that's that's one of the factors now of course is the gap of the pricing between the pro and the premium is widening mm-hmm. so significantly people yes. people are gonna I, people are gonna really start to i think question but part of the thing that that could be happening when you get back getting back to your comparison to jjp is Maybe the bomb on the premiums and LEs has been going up as Stern has been in, you know, inserting their price increases. Perhaps they've been like, you know what, we need to, we'll raise the price and let's put a little bit more in Ooh, the bomb on yeah. these in order to have it you know, stand out and be a little more distinguished. Thus not seeing such of a, an increase in the pro. as. Mm-hmm. But my guess, and you're the distro, so you'll be able to correct me once, and you, if you, you may need more time before you know, but I think in the case of Godzilla, the the mech difference was so compelling that a lot of people just had to go premium LE over the pro. I, I mean, it was the one time I did. I think on this, you're going to see a lot more even split of people going pro versus premium LE. Your analysis per usual is spot on there, Dennis. I will say that yeah, when it came to Godzilla, uh, we we don't have a backlog of pros right now. So our next run of pros, we will have some available. We are still... We are still waiting for um, uh, maybe I would say majority of our back order still for Godzilla premium. So yes, 100% unequivocally, without a doubt, the premium is the model there. Uh, I won't say tenfold, but it, fivefold. Now on this, you are correct. 
we are getting a lot more pro buyers. Now, it's hard to differentiate. Is that coming because of Max or is that coming because of discrepancy in price between now a pro and a premium? So it, it, it's hard to measure that, but a lot more pro buyers this time around. Having said that, the premiums still are outselling the pros at least two to one, if not closer to three to one. Mm. So it's still significant, but a lot of people are going pro. Like Godzilla, it is so surprising to me that game is so well received. Number one on Pinside Top 100, whether, you know, pro, premium, whatever. But people are waiting for the premiums when they can buy the pro. Mm-hmm. And I, I've, I've played the pro several times. It is, it is a fun game. Mm-hmm. But in the home environment, the mechs uh, were enough to convince me that I wanted a premium. Rush is kind of leveled out where we had a, an abundance of premium buyers. Over the last five years, people have really shifted towards the premium model of Stern Games, uh, the hobbyist, that is. But they were leveling out now. We see just as many sales of Rush Pro as we do premiums now. So about even now was initially uh, offset a little bit. Turtles, people are still buying more pro than premium. Uh, Mandalorian, believe it or not, people still barely, they're they're buying premiums more than pros. Well, it does have the moving play field. Mm-hmm. So there are some things here. Th- this is going to be more of a closer, a closer to call thing. So you're right there. Code, like I said, we don't know what's going on with code quite yet. I don't think you should put all your eggs into the Stranger Things basket because Brian Eddy did bring a lot to that package. But I think that if you would have asked three years ago what a response to a Lonnie Rop and a Mike Vinicor code set would be, it would be significantly different than the perceptions of that duo team today. Would you agree or disagree? Uh, I I don't know if I'd say significant. It's Mike Vinicor didn't really have much of a code rep, right? Was I don't know if Stranger True. Things was his first game or not, but so you know he's more of an unknown. Lonnie, you know, uh, people have mixed reactions with Lonnie. I think. The main complaint I've heard with with Lonnie is a lot of people feel he always kind of does the same thing with the rules. Mm-hmm. So where I think, uh, but with like Stranger Things, what I think happened is when you pair him with with Mike, I think you have something more you know different. Yeah, more when dynamic, you have another voice yeah. involved. But the one thing with Lonnie is uh, I, I, a lot of competitive players. While he may not be their favorite programmer, like he does know balance, he or I feel he knows well. balance. I've heard that too, he balances yeah. well, and so because of that. I think a lot of people like there are some people in the hobby that are very vocal, kind of like anti rop code, but by and large, I think most people are okay with it. That's what I think in the perception wise, uh, in the hobbyist community, Lonnie has trended up a little bit over the last year or so because he was just getting pelted. I mean, it, D- Dwight was really high up there. Uh, Lyman really high up there. Nagel really high. And then there was Lonnie. He was getting he was getting bruised and battered pretty good. But now we're seeing you know people start to say no, I don't want it to be Dwight Code. I don't want. I'd be fine with Lonnie actually. His rules are balanced. You know what you're going to get. And I would argue that Lonnie on this code, if you're apprehensive about code sets that Lonnie has done in the past, we know that he is solid. Knows what he's doing. Been in the industry forever. Balance as well. Look at all those faces. There's going to be a lot to do on this game. So just by default. A good, solid score with a lot of depth, I think, will be received very well. I don't know. I don't know how far along the code. Will I be. am we'll hearing. Say, we'll I, see it. This so. is a rumor that I've heard, but I have heard that there are, and we'll talk about production and delays in this game coming out a little bit longer, taking a little bit longer to produce than usually when they reveal a game. But I heard that we haven't seen a stream announcement yet because they would like to build up that code a little bit more mm, before they start showing it off. That's the rumor that I heard. Can't confirm that. We do have new pricing, as we alluded to. What's your take on the new pricing? Too much? Not enough? What the hell are you doing, Stern? Are they pricing surpri- people I, out? I mean, I was I was surprised the the way they did it. So I was expecting my prediction had been because of inflation that we were probably going to see something on the order of a four hundred to nine hundred dollar price increase. Okay, the premium was in line with where I was expecting. Towards the higher end, I guess, but well, kind of in the middle, really, between 400 and 900, 700. Mm-hmm. So um, the pro was an increase a lot lower than I expected given the current state of inflation. I agree. And the LE's increase was a lot more than I thought it would be, a lot more. I agree. So, I so agree. yeah, I mean, so in one way, I was not surprised. And in one way, I was surprised 
happily and when ways I was si- uh, you know surprised sadly as sad as I get about LEs which I don't care about. I'm with you as well. I thought the pro would be going up more than 100. I thought that they would likely try to squeeze in a little additional bump here in pricing across all models pretty evenly. I thought we'd see maybe a 3 to 400 dollar price increase for for each model. So the 100 did surprise me. The premium was a little bit higher than I thought it was going to be, quite honestly. And then the LE, that kind of really surprised me because I guess they're thinking, you know, it just surprised me a thousand units well, at $13,000. And I think and I think that's the JJP effect. Yeah, or, that's what as I, I was wondering. As I know, I, I've, ex- I've typed it probably on multiple discords at this point. It's, um, you know, LE buyers are whales. So why don't, har- why don't you harpoon them? Yeah, but here's the thing. You would have thought, uh, I would agree with that, but. They watched JJP kind of get egg in their face. On well, JJP list. like got twenty or twenty five or thirty mil. I forget how many millions and millions of dollars they got on day one, selling out all the C. They sold all the CES out, Zach. Sold yes, them all but, out. They're all sold out. But the sold Toy Story sales are affected because of price. Period. Zach sold out. CE whale. What did not surprise me, Dennis and listener, is that when these LEs did come out. They did sell out immediately. I could have sold as a deal. Sure. We got a large allotment. I could have sold double that easily. Yeah. Whales. Easily. Whales. Why? I, you honestly, know why though? You know why? It wasn't because of James Bond. I'm, I, for some reason, I feel strongly about this. It wasn't so much James Bond. James Bond's like, people love it. And they're like, okay, I can, it's like a Godzilla. All right. We're good there. Everybody knows that. It's freaking Gomez. People want to get that next, for, that Deadpool. They want that next Gomez game. He's like a king at this industry. I think it's going going a long way on this title. I really do. It it could, but I I think the LEs were going to sell out day one no matter what from Stern. Mm -hmm. I think they would have. And I think Stern's trying to – it's an intro – actually, I would say of the strategies, uh, overall, I think I like this approach from them. I think what they're going to do is they're bifurcating the way the hobbyists work. And I think they're going to continue to dramatically – profit gouge on the LEs more and more, continuing to jack that price up until they start to struggle just a little bit with selling them all Mm. while trying to keep the pro as low as possible to still allow an in. in. I don't think they want to alienate a lot of the hobbyists that just bottom line can't go into that price point. And so uh, that's the bifurcation. What I'm not sure on is the premiums. Mm. Um, I think what they'd like to do is make more money on the premiums than they have been, but they don't want to go, so far out that the premium is like more than what a lot of the other competitive, you know, as I, it's hard for me to say that the other companies are really <laughs> yeah, competition compet- to Stern, yeah. but like they, they still want it to sort of see, they want to float like around a, a CGC uh, yeah. prize well, or an American pinball. Well, cause but, the yeah. thing with the premium is, is the, the angle that Stern does, which even JJP has started to forsake is like, other than like minor little things, it's the same gameplay. Yeah. So it's like Ellie's are for whales. Premium are for people that want all the mechs, and pros are supposed to still be the value option in the for land people of the to be sea, able to get in. If a whale was to LE, what would premium be? It'd be a more of a... Well, if you want to... I mean, if the premium prices keep going up, they're orca. both going to be whales, but the premium is going to be like a beluga whale, and the LE will be like a sperm whale. So your premium is still a whale. I don't like it being a whale. Could I think be. it should be more of like a... Um, more, the game's almost ten thousand dollars, Zach. I, I mean, at some point you turn into a we- when you start throwing ninety seven hundred dollars out at games. At some point, you ain't middle class, okay? Yeah, it's yeah. just, I mean, we there is a line there, especially with the inflationary pressure. A lot of people have less discretionary income right now than they did a year ago. Now that might not be true because there's a lot of people out there, including myself, that are middle class that just don't always make great decisions. <laughs> so- Maybe. Yes, yeah, I'm I'm over, I'm over generalizing That's for right. effect, but but my my point my point is that there were people, and we've seen them, we've seen them in the we've seen them on the Facebook, we've seen them in comment threads that were they would love to get a premium, but given another seven hundred dollars after last year, the premiums went up what over a thousand. Mm. I mean, the pros went up last year nine hundred dollars. Yes, I know four hundred of the price increase where the stern is are connected, but it's still you had to pay it. Mm-hmm. You didn't have an option to not take it. So. At some point, it's just compared to how much their paychecks go up, they're just like, they don't, they can't rationalize it anymore. Or they rationalize down and say, okay, I can't rationalize the premium anymore. So I'm going to get a pro. Again, you and I know someone loves James Bond, mm-hmm. dream theme for them. When they saw the LE price go out, they knew immediately they weren't getting the LE. And they preferred it too. They really wanted the LE. Yep. And, and they're struggling 
on the premium mm-hmm. as an option. Like they're str- like, and they could afford it. It's just at some point it becomes in the to some people it becomes irresponsible to spend that amount. I hear you. And listeners will want to hear this. I've got to be careful here. Uh, so I can't talk about as a dealer, as authorized dealer, I can't talk about margins and, and what we're making or anything like that. That goes against policy. But I think what I can skate around and say, because people have been asking, well, if the pro went up a hundred and the premium went up 700 and then the LE went up this much, like how does that break down for you guys? Margin wise, is it basically just whatever it went up that's forwarded to you? Like, how does that work? Oh, like that all the, did all the profit go to the exactly. distributors? Yeah. Where did the profit go? I can say that I, I don't know if I can say, but I'm I'm hoping that I can say that I was surprised both in a positive and negative way about how the breakouts landed for the dealers. It did change things and I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. That doesn't make sense. And I'm like, oh, well, that's nice. I see that. So there were some changes there. I think I can say this. You guys like information, don't you, listener? That's why you love us over here at the Pinball Show. I can say that uh, the MSRP for these, and there are different forms of, you can do a map, uh, minimal advertising price, what we're allowed to advertise them for. Uh, Stern in the past has had MURPs, uh, the the lowest we're allowed to sell it for, the the floor, but we can't advertise at that price. But So they matched a lot of these things. So... Very much like the other manufacturers. Other manufacturers, Chicago Gaming Company, they've got one price, they got one price. JJP, they got one price. You can't advertise any lower than that one price, and that price is universal. I, I heard from a not from a not Zach source uh, that the pros were completely unified, so the MSRP is everything now. Correct. That's right. So yeah, there there is for the pro there, it's sixty nine ninety nine. Hmm. Does that? Do you think that's a strategy to try and eliminate some of the smaller distributors? Because I had heard reports that the smaller distributors often relied upon people, you know, they wouldn't advertise it, but they would just sell at, at a map or something and, and sell for lower. And that's how they stayed afloat. But what, now with it, it could be, I mean, it, now with it being the same as the MSRP, their one advantage to turning to Joe Bob's Stern dealer mm-hmm. is gone. Yeah. Yeah. And MSRP is the same for Ellie's as well. It's 12999. That's, mm, okay. that's the lowest you can advertise for that. That. That is it. Uh, I wouldn't mind. People are like, oh, all these little dealers, the really hardworking little dealers that are putting in the work. I don't. I wouldn't. I would never want to see them go away. But there are plenty of dealers out here that are just. I'm sorry. They're they're billiard stores and they know nothing about pinball. They're dealers uh, and they'll sell them if they can, but they're not ordering inventory. I want them to go away. They're a succubus. They're taking all mm. of our hardworking dealers allotments. So yeah, I'd be okay if they uh, if they went away and went away far away. That's it's an interesting dynamic that we have in the dealership network. So the reason that these things aren't coming out until later, we'll talk about a production update. But uh, basically, bonds aren't starting until November. Production is not starting until November. We have a whole month, people, of October that we get no bonds. It's very different, and that's parts delays. They told us parts delays are the issues for that. I'm very confused about that, Zach. Because I just, again, especially with the delays that they ended up doing, why why do the reveal now if they're so far out from production? They don't normally do that. Well, I think because it aligns with the 60th anniversary kind of thing of James Bond. Uh, they knew that they were going to have events that they were going to. They probably planned on having this thing out in August and then start going to these different 60th I, anniversary yeah, events. I guess, you know. There was a rumor that this has shifted and that Venom was supposed to be first, but it got punted. That I don't know. I heard some of those rumors, but I don't That's know. That's why we call it a rumor, because it's not. We don't yeah, know if it's I true. I don't Could know. Could very well be not true. Or maybe this is just a a hidden way to develop code more. Who knows? So 60th, 60th anniversary. So there's an Elwyn bond. A lot of questions uh, with the release of this game. A lot of questions with the production of this game. A lot of questions with Goldfinger and where that's at. And is it coming in the future? Questions about accessories. Uh, they they said coming soon. Topper, art blades, armor. Mm. As soon rod. as the uh, Godzilla toppers come. Uh, who knows? And the other question, the big question in the room is, yeah, the 60th anniversary James Bond 007 game designed by Keith Elwin. Here are some of the things, listener, that you may or very well may not know. We know it's a it's a Keith Elwin design. We know that it will be limited to 500 units. That's half of the LE for the regular cornerstone. 
we know that they're aiming at starting to produce this game in late December. So we get a late December Q4 kind of uh, release here. We know that it's going to be a street level. Ah, single level. It's going to be a single level. Gary called it a retro-inspired play field. Okay. Well, yeah. Dang it. No ramps. No whamps. Do you it, think Ellen will have the shoot the whamps inserted in there just to, like as a joke? Shoot the whamps, pushy. <laughs> It could be it could be any bond. We could get Pierce to say that. Shoot the ramps. Christmas Jones. No ramps. Retro inspired playfield. It is going to it's supposed to incorporate all twenty five Bond films and the Bond actors. Gary and Seth said there are ball activated mechanical devices in the game. That's fancy way of saying what is it? Like a bash target? Or bash? Yeah, stand ups. <laughs> yeah, I know. Shoot the stand up wamp. Uh, but I mean, if there maybe there are interactive mechs in this game. Just, that's an awful wordy way to describe it. They described it also this Elwin game, a special game, as a classic drop target game with ten drop targets. That is a lot of drops in this day and age. It is kinetic spinning disc versus the non kinetic one. I think it said odd jobs hat probably. Oh, okay. So that makes sense. As I'm saying this, I'm like, am I allowed to review? I think so. Multiple fast flowing spinners. The Insider Connected podcast transcript interview said four spinners, which Ooh. I can't think. I was trying to think of a single level with four. I could not. Right into the pimple network at gmail.com. Yeah. If you know of a single level that had four spinners, I can think of three spinners on several, but I, I struggled to find four. In fact, I, I couldn't think of four. And we oftentimes on Keith Elwin Designs, People love the placement of his spinners because they are fast flowing, multiple combo shots. And spinners. I also read they're all for Opto. Whoa, <laughs> that would be sweet. Diamonds are forever. <laughs> now here, here's a detail. Get your out, Craig Bobby. A, <laughs> Roger Moore. <laughs> Diamonds are forever. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to. <laughs> I expect you to. <laughs> Remember, that's a Ryan C. call back there. <laughs> Skipping stones. I don't know. A, a bit of a controversial topic here is that when describing this game, Gary and Seth indicated to dealers that it would have mechanical scoring reels. Now, Dennis talked about it earlier, listener. There was a leak on the 007 shop or website or something that showed the 60th anniversary game, but it had an mm. LCD screen with digital That's animations what it looked like to of me. mechanical I mean, reels. I I didn't zoom in and enhance, but I saw that. It was, and was an like, LCD and I screen. Had, I had only heard score reels. I hadn't heard mechanical because I wasn't part of the distro call, but I was like, really? Which made me think that that was a Aww. fake. But if it came from that 007 website. Yeah, they didn't mock it. I mean, they didn't make their own art for that. They, uh, and speaking of woof, oh my gosh. Is it's I get it, twenty five films, but did we have to collage all the posters? <laughs> my sister wrote to me. My sister, she she does not buy oh. new inbox pinball machines, but she she wrote to me about they do. She and her husband they have a couple couple machines, mm-hmm. and and she wrote to me and she goes, I finally saw the the Bond, and I uh, finally I, I at first I didn't know which, and then I realized she'd seen the Elwin Bond. She's like. Why is there? Why is it a collage? <laughs> she was she was very nice about it. But I was like, why, is, why is it a collage? And I'm like, I don't. I I guess the license. The artist likes you, you get one thing: posters, know. and that's it. I don't know what your sister's name is, but she feels like a tabby. I think I'm gonna start calling <laughs> she, her. She is not tabby. She's not a tabby. That no? would be the name of a cat. It's better than calling her Pushy Crisol. <laughs> <laughs> Pushy Crisol. <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna go with gosh, Tabby. You're so mean. Uh, Gary and Seth <sighs> also said there's a playfield mounted LCD screen on the 60th anniversary James Bond 007 game. Where, like Highway Alien in the playfield? Or? Yeah, playfield mounted could be Star Wars. Or it's I, gonna be like a a tablet, but it's not really a tablet, Toy Story style. Rumors were that they're gonna take the same size monitor from the the home pen and put it somewhere on the playfield. But I'm oh, like, okay. man, if you're featuring all 25 Bond films, damn it, Get, make the monitor bigger. If anything, don't make it smaller. Just gotta be a baby monitor. The the, the <laughs> monitor leaked... is this a monitor for ants? <laughs> right. the, the monitor for manatees. The, it does come with. We saw these leaked photos. If they are true, it comes with armor and a topper. And people shitting on this topper. I think the topper's sleek and sharp. That's actually the best looking part of it. I like it. 
I don't know. I, I for those of you who have not seen the pictures, they're floating around on Facebook right now. Um, yeah, I mean, my my impression and again, couldn't I couldn't see the play field, so I don't know. But it is an Elwin. When I saw the the you know the decisions for the art and especially like digital reels and all that and and home pin style displays not home pin as in uh sure the final tap we'll get to that later uh my my impression was wow they are really just testing how powerful the elwin name is Mm -hmm. and it it felt like everything else was just like not a reason that you'd want it but maybe that's all you need uh, well, I think it is. I think they, I think that, how many calls have you, Zach, reveal this. How many calls have you already had to order one of these? Because I have a feeling it's more than three. I would say over 40, probably. Okay. People want to know. That's all it takes. People that's want a, to know. That's Elwin's power. But because he hasn't failed us yet. No, he hasn't. But uh, again, it's like, uh, it's like how we used to do the same, you know, a few years ago with, with Lyman Sheets code. Yep. If you and found Lyman out Lyman trust. was on a game, I knew plenty of people. If Lyman was on the game, the game was bought. Mm-hmm. And you could say, well, look at how uh, bare bones Elvira, or it's not Elvira, but Batman 66 was. And it de- it's like, it doesn't matter. You know that Lyman was going to make it good. It's the code. And in this case, you know, Elwin's rules and Elwin's layouts have always been winners. Especially when we know his history of competitive pinball. This is his first time to really showcase a nostalgic, um, classic feel to a game. My favorite thing is he was, I guess, on uh, on a stream, and it talked about how it wasn't a he didn't he wasn't reskinning Quicksilver, and everyone just twisted that to Elwin said he's not doing a 007. Oh, really? Yes, <laughs> that's funny. It's just like, oh my gosh, people! It's just like they convinced themselves the lie sets in, and they're like, he lied to us. Elwin lies a traitor. Now that you he, say that, how many drops like, does Quicksilver have? Uh, you know, I don't. I thought it had more than one bank, so I don't. It does. I don't know. And this, I, I in the interview, the Gomez interview on Stern Insider. Again, I didn't hear the interview. I, I read the transcript, which mm-hmm. the uh, the transcripts uh, voice to text wasn't always the best because I think at one point Keith became Keith Olson. So yeah. I was getting very confused. But um, I think there's not only the drop a bank of drops, but there's also a set of inline drops. Oh, ooh, I do love some inline drops. I always want them to bring that back, Dolly. You could get a you could get a fathom revisited and revisit those inline drops, or a TNA 2.0, which Scott Denise said don't call it a 2.0, but Spooky calls it a 2.0. <laughs> we'll call it what we want to. <laughs> I would do what we want. We made Halloween. So that's about all we know for the 60th anniversary James Bond 007 Keith Elwin designed game. I don't know when people ask me. I don't know pricing. You know, there's rumors out there that dealers get to set the pricing. I, I have no clue. I don't know my allotment of how many we will get. I don't know when they will reveal this game. They did say very soon. And if they're planning on producing it in December, I would say maybe one of these events at the end of the month here might be a good guess. All right, so that's all we know. That's a lot. We know a lot, Dennis. Are we behind the curtains now? We know maybe too much. Oh, maybe we do, Pushy. We even know about production scheduling updates over at Stern Pinball. A lot of changes since we've last spoke, listener. For example, Star Wars Premium's on the line right now. Your last call for Guardians Pro starting this week. First week of October, we're finishing up some Led Zeppelin Premiums and then starting, oh, we're starting a new additional run of Godzilla Premium. People don't like it. Yes, they do. We love your adorable One person roar. doesn't like it. Third and fourth weeks of October, Wait, huh? Okay. Turtles? So Turtles 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 was bumped from December to this month, then bumped back to December. Now they're bumping it back up to October. Huh. Okay. Now Turtles is in October. I've got terrible turtle rage if I went into (laughs) Turtles because I'm getting really confused. Oh, probably because you're not part of the Turtle Club. Mm, Yep. First and second weeks of November, Star Wars Home Edition. Ooh, the movie and the comic versions. Mm-hmm. And they're going to do all those home pins uh, before Q4 here. So second week in November, they're going to simultaneously run the James Bond Pro for locations only. <gasps> Everybody's like, can I get in? Can I get can in I on get, your first yeah, run? Yeah, that's pros? me. And you're always like, no, Dennis, I'm not allowed. And people think I'm always lying. I'm like, why I will, am I subjected to your stupid I will rules? send you the form that Stern now makes dealers fill out for every damn one of these location pros. 
Is it a Stern Army? Is it not? What's the address? Who's the operator? What's the operator's email? What's the operator's? Oh, my God. <sighs> Second week in November is James Bond Pro, four locations. End of November, Jurassic Park Home and James Bond LEs. Bow, 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 bow. Early. It still seems so far out for a game they I just know. revealed. Early to mid-December, James Bond Premium. That first run might get before Christmas time. Unless the Creasel Grinch steals it. <laughs> oh, I am not steals. <laughs> I am not steals. Late December is James Bond 007 60th Anniversary Edition. Late December. And everybody right now is saying, uh, Zach, what about Elvira's House of Horrors? Uh-oh. Dan Dan. Mm. The whores have left the building. They're going to be bumped to next year. <gasps> oh. Oh, no. But it's okay because the old price has still been locked in. Okay, so here's the thing on that. Uh, they're hoping Q1 production, but there's still going to be a price increase for Elvira. They just don't know what it is yet, just like I said last time. <laughs> and then if you guys are looking forward to a James Bond Pro for your home or a premium, the second runs of James Bond Pro and premium will be April 2023. And then effective immediately... <laughs> You heard me right. April 2023 for the second run pro and premium of the new Cornerstone release of James Bond. Mm. October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Shit. Seven months. Jesus. You know how many emails I get to answer? It says, hey, if I were to buy a premium, can you get me in the first run of the premiums? It's coming out in November. I know it always makes me feel bad. I don't, I don't blame those people because I would want a first run too, so I'd call around too. But I'm like, guys, I don't have a lot of first. Like, I, they're like, Either you can give me a first run or I'm out. Or I'm out until I'm like, they change their mind. But it is, I mean, it is a long wait. Yeah, it's not I like them it. being yeah. asked to wait 60 days for the second run. It's just so I'm hard just, to see a uh, see a sale go away. Other questions about production scheduling include effective immediately. All of the home versions of Stern Pinball Machines have new pricing. So we get Are um, they lower? We get immediate pricing for Bond when it comes out. That price increased. We see the same thing for the home pen versions, which are now all forty nine ninety nine. Oh, <laughs> take it to the bank! Ouch! So starting now, and then new pricing. People are like, "Well, at least the old games are going to now." New pricing for anything non bond and non home game will go into effect January one, as usual. That's standard, as for usual. Them. But for those of you, and I'm sorry for those of you who have. A Jurassic Park premium that they're not going to run until next year. A Deadpool. A you know, you, you take your pick of Avengers. If you've ordered it, even if you've paid for it, dealers will contact you for additional funds in order to pay the remainder, or else <sighs> they'll have to cancel. I, you know, that's why my I know one of my I, least favorite Stern business practices is that. Be, now I, I, I guess agree. I get it because I don't I think agree. Stern's actually requiring the money, but I still think it's kind of tasteless it's not the buyer's fault that they had to wait this long no it's not i hate that i damn i hate it too and i can't put myself in their shoes and say i wouldn't do that because technically i am doing that because i'm forwarding it on to the dealer or yeah but that's not your choice that's no because the price for the prior price if i were to say you know what i can still sell it to you at that and i'll just eat the cost and pay you to take pinball machines, which doesn't make business sense. No, that, see, that's it doesn't, still it would, it wouldn't make sense. going but against the, got, a, the agreement that we have signed uh, on a, a threshold, a floor of a price that we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. the, the MSRP and the map price. So I'd be just, breaking a know, deal and losing money. It's just, but when you've got Jersey Jack, like when they raised the prices on the GNRs and they said, everyone's already got a pre-order in, old price is honored. We just saw Multimorphic uh, raise the price of their modules, but anyone who ordered before, I think September 1st got to lock in the old price. You mm-hmm. know, it's when you're the outlier, even if you're the biggest manufacturer, you're still the outlier. Like everyone else is doing it in a way that most people would think of as quote unquote fair. Yeah. And I think devil's advocate would say the stern pinball CFO right now sit in his office and say, well, that's cute. If we only sold as many games as Multimorphic does, then we can talk about that. Keep raising your prices and maybe we'll see that. Oh, Mr. CFO, if that is your name, you know what I say about all that? That's what I say. You know what I say about all that? GTF. Pew, pew, pew. We're not going to talk about GTF right now, but we are going to talk about JJP. Aww. Another three letter. An acronym? An it's initialism? An, it's an, an acronym. Usually I call them initialisms when we say the letters out. A week or two ago on the Flipping Out Pinball stream, 
go like, follow, and subscribe. Pink. The JJP team come, and they hung out with the gang over at Studio B, and they played Toy Story 4 LE. It was very enjoyable. They talked a lot, so much so they that did. exclusive news came out. Hashtag where's the uh, media? Hashtag right fucking here. I missed this part because I only caught the very end of the stream. JT Harkey has been working there for a long time. He's a, uh, a programmer. He's worked on you know the Wonkas of the world. He's worked on GNRs. He's worked on all of it. He announced that he is going to be the lead programmer on the upcoming Steve Ritchie title. Oh, Ooh. mid-speed three. Big news. So Steve Ritchie's going to get the lead of JT Harkey. Mm. Harkey's good too. I like him. I like him. Okay. Peter Dorn was also there. He's the JJP project manager. And he said something that went against what Jack Winery recently said. What? About licensing in Toy Story, Toy Story 4. He said, quote, Say what? <laughs> Say what? Fucking Craig Bobby. He's building a catalog. We got to watch him, Dennis. He's building a catalog on us. Fucking Hulk 2D2 sitting on a bench. Beep, 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 beep. Peter Dorn said the following, quote, Toy Story is a phenomenal license to have. Disney has the absolute right to tell us what to do with the game. So, when we were directed to do Toy Story 4, that's all we had to do. With the license, we really didn't have a choice. But Jack said that they were like, we'd love to do Toy Story 4. What a great idea. <laughs> Let's do it. I don't the first know what to are make of old. any of this. What do we make of this stuff? I, you know, I'm wondering if this, I, I've heard Jack G is more and more distance from the day to day of the company. I, I mean, push comes to shove. I would probably trust the words of the project manager who would be more directly involved more, but you know, just all things being equal, but I'm wondering, this is some damage control hmm. because I mean, we we all saw, I mean, we have eyes. We all saw the reaction of the community after Jack did that interview. I think it was on Super Awesome and was like, oh, no, we, we yeah, Disney asked us to do Toy Story 4, but we were all like all in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And right. It's like, then the community's response has been, you have got to be kidding me. Doing just one, just the first three or all four are all superior choices to just mm -hmm. doing Toy Story 4. Absolutely. It's like an objective fact. And I'll pull back the curtain a little bit here. Whenever I heard Jack Winery say that on that podcast interview, number one, I was like, even if that were the case, what the fuck? Why would you say that? Number two, I was taken back by it because it did go against the information that I did have as well, coming from uh, the offices in the in the factory over in well, Chicago. It, it was every I had I had heard they had to do it. I had up until that interview, that is all I had heard. But mm -hmm. again, you know, I'm hearing things secondhand and stuff. So I'm like, okay, well, Jack's now saying no, they chose it. And it's like, he's an official employee yeah. owner type. I don't know mm -hmm. what exactly his relationship is anymore with the investors. But, but it's like when he came out and said like it was voluntary, it just, uh, I mean, even if it was true, it looked really bad. And it, like, did. it just looked like you didn't know you, like you had bad decision making. And it did not air. There were additional pieces of the featurette when we were doing the Toy Story 4 thing for Straight Down the Middle. Uh, there were additional pieces that just didn't make the the cut. You have to right. make they these have to things. Hit the floor. Yeah. So we were going to release it later, but I can say, you know, uh, Pat Lawler is not is no longer with Jersey Jack Pinball. He had full intention and did discuss that on the featurette, and he said it just didn't fit in the featurette. But he said that, and that's where I had the info from, straight from the horse's mouth. Isn't that what they say? Why does that have to be the horse's mouth? I don't know. He doesn't look like a horse. He's not so that's very horse-like, but straight from his mouth, he said initially, uh, you know, paraphrasing here, he said initially, yeah, the idea was to do just the Toy Story branding and theming. Um, assets would have been significantly different, maybe not, uh, not up to the par of what we wanted. But then over time, as the film got delayed and then the license kind of got delayed, uh, design maybe got delayed, all that, then yeah, they were then pushed to hey, you're doing Toy Story four. Like that's that's the newest product that we have out film wise. That's got the best digital assets. Everything else is archaic now uh, with visualizations. You, we want you to do Toy Story four. So I was surprised too. Yeah, who knows? You know what else surprises me? No, that there's going to be no Stern tour, physical tour this year at Chicago Pinball Expo. 
Interesting. It's always. They always have a tour. It's going to be virtual I mean, they again. had to do it virtually last year, but there, were, Chicago still had a lot of pretty stringent pandemic mm-hmm. requirements yeah. uh, last year during Expo. But that, the, but those are lifted now. Yeah. This year, JJP stepping in and said, we're going to do the factory tour at Expo, but we're not going to charge a dollar for it. Mm. I think the other ones, I think Chicago Expo was charging 50 bucks for a Stern tour. This is free. Not only is it oh. free, you're not in school buses. These have training up coach buses. The people are going to oh, be riding Oh, I know people in. who love their bags. Yeah, charter buses. Oh, coat. I see. What you're so, yeah. I'm glad you caught that. Make sure that you hop on a bus, I think Thursday morning, and head over to the factory. It is a cool factory. I liked it. Only other news this week uh, we've got, and we don't have time to talk about, we got Chicago Gaming Company. They're expected to start shipping the Cactus Canyon remake LEs in a couple weeks oh, here. Finally. Yeah, uh, so those should be coming out two to three weeks. Toppers have been solved. Yeah, they have the parts for it and everything. It's just building them now. And then uh, Home Pin revealed this is Spinal Tap, um, a pinball machine. And was it? I mean, yeah, I. I, you know wow. what? I, I'm going to say this. I don't give. I could care less about that theme. I don't even think I've seen that whole movie. The art is atrocious. The topper almost makes me want to like it, but it looks like I built it. Yeah, I got. I got to say, Stern kind of got a mini boon with the the critiques about the James Bond art, and then <laughs> then the Spinal Tap playfield oh, pictures God. came out. Oof. And it's like, okay, you want you want true Photoshop error? Here you go. No, so so true. So I don't, but and the I, price though, the, the price, price oh is just God. atrocious. The price. And that's the thing. There are some people that they love the theme. They give a lot of it the pass that price. It's like 10, five us. It's, it's a lot. Nope. I think all a potential buyer interested party would need to know is that this person designing this game or running this company chose to put an LCD screen and a fucking orange DMD. And if you look anything past that, I don't care if it shoots like a Keith Elwin it is a bad product. Come on. Come on, read the room, I, it, get with the time. It's, no. Yeah, it's a, it's, it was a shockingly weird decision. And I, and I was wrong. It's not ten five. It's 9500 is the price. Okay. There, it's so still 5000 too much. The design didn't, that did not look horrible, though. The layout. No, I, I would say, uh, again, I only saw like 20 seconds of gameplay. Cause again, potato cam, no one bothered sure. to do anything proper. Uh, but it did look like it would play better than Thunderbirds did. Yes. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. But, but it's, it's just, it looks like a shit game. I, I don't really want to I mean, cover it. I don't. It's but, it's not a ninety five. I I you look at that and you're like, it's not. It doesn't look like a ninety five hundred dollar game at all, even no, in no. this market. Nope. That's your news. Bink. Uh Dennis Pinball Market Trends takes all shapes and forms. It comes in all sizes and colors. It doesn't discriminate. It's a living, breathing segment that people have come to love and respect and follow and trust. It's the type of pinball segment you want to take home to meet your parents. But it's also the segment that may get caught out in the backyard smoking a stogie with its future father-in-law. To you all, it's simply unfiltered entertainment. But the best forms of entertainment always come with a healthy dose of truth. This is Pinball Market Trends. Trending up this week is Stern Pricing. I say that tongue-in-cheek, but it is true that Stern's recent announcement of price increases, some of the models being very significantly increased, it will have an effect on the market moving forward. Some may call this another correction in the ever-evolving, living, breathing market. Now, to a certain extent, sure, but overall, I'm not yet convinced. As long as Stern Pinball continues to be the preferred product for hobbyists and operators, it's certainly going to help uphold the value of newer games, especially that Spike 2 catalog. And now it certainly does make sense for some titles, such as Guardians of the Galaxy, Led Zeppelin, to be retiring, which is going to help hold the value of those titles that probably wouldn't see significant additional sales from a future January 1 price increase that's coming. But games like Avengers, Infinity Quest, Iron Maiden, Deadpool, Jurassic Park, and even the competitive pinball darling Rush, those games are sought after. Even with a price increase coming Jan 1, they will still sell. They will still sell well. And the reference to the correction that I'm speaking of is that these new inbox titles by Stern that are going up at the beginning of the year will help stabilize the secondary market on used Spike 2 games. You're not going to see Deadpool significantly creep down now. 
because new premiums are no longer $89.99, they're $96.99. You cannot purchase a brand new in-box Iron Maiden LE, but if you have a used one and new LEs are going for $13,000, that makes that $15,000 secondary market Iron Maiden LE stay at $15,000 a little longer. And I say all this hesitantly because I don't believe that it's going to drastically affect the marketplace maybe as it has in the past with these price increases. But it certainly is another technique and tactic to use to continue selling products that everybody has to have regardless of price, it seems like, and stabilize that of trending down values of the remainder of your catalog. It's economics, people. Trending up this week is Pinball Party Podcast. Numbers don't lie. Put in the air horn there. We only report the facts. This poor guy jumps in with a new new podcast here. We jump in at episode five once he joined TPN. Yeah, you like seduced him into joining TPN. Oh, uh, well, you know. Because you're like, there's this podcast, and I think it's really good, and I think we should ask him <laughs> if he wants to join. And all shucks in it and kicking rocks. And, you know, maybe yeah. we just ask him. He, he seems like and a good thing I know is like, because I'm going to be on the episode that premieres on the network. <laughs> <laughs> air horn. Featuring me. <laughs> Pew, pew, pew. There you go. There's your air horn pushy. Pinball Party Podcast. The only reason I'm training him up is because objectively, numbers do not lie. Hot damn. Maybe it's because it's our only podcast last week. Woo. That thing's soaring high. Cacow. A lot of great feedback, too. So for those wondering if it's not doing well, I assure you it's doing very, very well. Also training up this week is Pinball Machine Artwork. Prior to 2022. <laughs> oh, oh. What I, so, happened to all so the what's pinball gonna, artwork? So what's going to win this year? I'm going to guess it's, it's got to either be Toy Story I 4 or, or maybe Rush. I, what happened? Stern, look, I get it. I get it with the whole Franchi thing. You know, I, I understand. Believe me. That doesn't mean that you can't have artists come in that do what he does. Give us some of the uh, people love Franchi art. Their their hands were tied, Zach. Tied hands are a death sentence. They're like a tiny net. As I get it, like just give us back what we want. And we want Zombie Yeti and we want Franchi. That's what we want. Dirty Donnie. I put Dirty Donnie. I know this is gonna be a strong take. I put Dirty Donnie there with uh with Johnny Crap. Give me some Randy Martinez again. Even JJP, come on, run away. I just what imagine a- Randy Martinez. I know he could do lots of art, but I just imagine the James Bond play field and he just, the Bond just has Mandalorian helmets on in every spot <laughs> that Sean Connery has. And just see a Mandalorian helmet. It's like, it's been mar- it's been randified. So I, I want to see Baby Yoda strapped down to the laser Goldfinger <laughs> table about to get cut in half. Like, for what, whatever people want to say about Franchi, like, this freaking art is gorgeous. Like, I want them to take Franchi's portfolio. This is Stern. Even if they don't want to hire Franchi again, take all of his artwork, any of the shit he's trying to sell that he's not supposed to be selling, take it to all these artists and be like, can you do this? This is this is what the pinball people want. And just give us that. Man, even uh, American Pinball, I'm paying attention to you as well. No more Oktoberfest. We want good artwork. Artwork sells. Feels like we're taking a step backwards. Am I crazy? I wouldn't mind. Am be I totally taking crazy surprised. pills? You know, no, I don't know. I mean, you've been talking about. You talked about it on the party podcast about um, you know pinball improving every year, and I'm I'm kind of wondering, and maybe it's just because of the releases, and obviously we're not at the end of the year yet, but mm-hmm. I'm starting to think 2022 might be seen as an inferior year to 2021. Oh, oh you Godzilla biased bastard! You. I I I know that's not it's not fair really for me to to bring that up but i mean you may be right i don't want to agree with you on that do you think we see another reveal from stern this year no i do not okay especially not with bond production happening till november okay so we get one more one more reveal from stern essentially we get a jjp reveal maybe I think my maybe spies too. are telling me that oh. that come down to parts. Ooh, look at you. Me, Matt Connor. Go check it out. EGP Chicago gaming. Do we get enough? I mean, they're still doing cactus Kings. Do we see anything else this year from them? All signs point to yes. What? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. What about from, uh, haggis? What about from haggis? No, 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 no. no. I stopped on box. My fathom. It's sitting there. Oh, no. Pinball Adventures? 
You know what? Maybe. Getting closer. Punnier things have happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, that's not the only game they got in the works. What about Multimorphic? Well, they just had Weird Al this year. I don't, not with the backlog on that, no. Okay. Now, that doesn't count third-party reveals. Turner Pinball? So, there might be a third-party. <laughs> Turner Pinball? No. Got a sack. No. Oh, my God. Uh, all right, I don't even I know where I'm at. About, Turn, I forgot we, about them. Get, get, oh uh, bring Why? back. Why don't you bring up Great Lakes Pinball while we're at it? Weren't they going to do Deja Vu or something? <laughs> I've been in this. I'm like Pepperidge Farm, okay? I've been in this hobby a long time. I remember some of the companies that didn't ever put out anything. So. Uh, Raisin Brand, two scoops. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, wrapping up, it, Stern, you know what we want. Please, but just give us what we want. That's all we want. Bring back the art. Bring back the wamps. There's going to be a mutiny, Dennis, if the wamps callouts don't get updated. We want the, those back. The wamp, wamp gate is right up there with when Scott like ruined the beep on TNA. Yes. That's right. That yeah. That does deserve to trend down. The Bring newest update wamps. for Godzilla, they got rid of a lot of shoot the wamps. Yeah. And we are not happy. No. We need those wamps. We have They're embraced like the original... this call out as a bobbly bobo and we yes. want them back. We want, th- yes, it's. We demand we, them back. We bring jo- joy to ourselves by saying that one. It's mm-hmm. like when Scott Denisi changed the beep on yes, TNA. That's right. It's like, he's like, well, it's more better audio balance and all that for the song. I'm like, no, I don't care. I, it's beep. Don't it deep beep. It should be obnoxious and beepy. I was, be- I don't Ew. beep with my TNA anymore. Do you I not? Did on the old, I did on the old beeps. Wow. And it took, he took my beep joy away. And now my wamp joy is gone. Uh- we need it back. Elwin, don't be hard headed. Elwin, don't make me choose rush. Don't make me choose rush over Godzilla. You're a hard headed guy. I need my wamps. But we want our wamps back. I need to shoot. How will I know to shoot them if you do not tell me to? That's right. And sadly, it's not all praise and trendings up here on Pinball Market Trends. Trending down this week, I got to do it. Canada's Pinball Podcast. Now, I was hesitant to even put this discussion into pinball market trends because this segment's often filled with uh, gimmicks, silliness, entertainment techniques, bad impersonations. But today I'd like to be a little bit more frank, a little bit more serious, because trending down a fellow podcast channel is something not to be taken lightly. In the past, I've poked my friends and trended them up and down, and and it was done so with an understanding and, and good fun. But this last week... I've heard myself, sometimes my family, my personal information discussed on Canada's Pinball podcast or live stream to the point that even I am tired of hearing about myself on someone else's media channel. Many of you listeners may not know the things I'll be referencing. Many of you don't care to hear about pinball media drama and admittedly feels kind of icky even having to spend time on this. So I understand. That doesn't make it any less important, though, to discuss. And my focus and discussion this week on Canada's Pinball Podcast may not be of central focus to the provider and host themselves, but rather to many of those who consume said content. I've listened to many episodes of Chris's podcast, watched a lot of live streams. He's talented in so many ways, very entertaining. Controversy sells, literally sells. He does the Patreon thing, which he's doing well with. There's so many attributes to this person and what talents they have and can provide for this industry, community, hobby. But sadly, a pervasive pattern of behavior occurs that needs further analysis. Dennis is no longer on the call. He'll be back. So these are my thoughts, my experiences. And before you write this off as just more pinball drama, I encourage you to listen. And maybe even you, a good exercise on putting yourself in other people's shoes. Chris Kouleris, or Kaneda, as he calls himself, has a pattern of behavior that at this point is pretty calculated, charted up pretty easily. And while I will not map that out, I will say that a lot of his recent content not only discusses myself, but also has the potential at harm. His content is consumed by many. His content is paid for by many. But much of his behavior has been and is at times harmful, negative, and cringy to a lot of the people that you respect in this industry. I've been accused of a lot of things this last week by Chris, including but not limited to him getting banned from the Chicago Pinball Expo. That's a rumor going around and publicly and live on the internet. 
first reaction was to blame myself and my wife, Nicole Minnie, for the reason that he was banned from a pinball convention. That's simply not true. We've talked on here and other media outlets have talked about the upcoming fundraiser at the Pinball Expo called Flipping the Script on Autism. It's a fundraiser to help with children's autism efforts and treatments, therapies. The Loser Kid Pinball Podcast, Josh and Scott, have created this fundraiser and they've put in so much work alongside many other media outlets to make this thing a success, which makes me proud to even be in the industry uh, when people are giving back to the extent that they will be. Canada got wind of this fundraiser and wanted to participate. And while everyone would love to maximize participation in a fundraiser for, for children, sometimes it's not always the most appropriate to have every party involved. Chris has burned a lot of bridges in this industry and has caused harm. And for those people receiving such harm, it is hard to forget. And it's hard to stay focused when a participant has caused so much conflict in the past. I was told he was banned from Expo, and once Chris found out that he was asked not to participate with, uh, whether it's live streaming or interviewing or anything, he threw a fit and made insinuations that he would make attempts to disrupt the fundraiser that was going to go on. He also took the time to again publicly, on live internet, blame myself for organizers to ask him not to be part of a fundraiser. Again, if he only knew, I mean, just simply, simply not true. He blamed TPN for why he couldn't be a part of the fundraiser again. Objectively and factually, not true. And that's fine, as long as the truth is out there. The, the issue and the pattern behavior that I'm just, frankly, I'm getting just tired of dealing with is creating a narrative, a drip feed for others to consume. That does affect the reputation of a person, whether it's the truth or not. If you spoon feed little bits of false information long term, it does have lasting effects. And whether you delete a video after you're severely inebriated, saying hateful things, toxic things, placing blame where it should not be placed, and saying people by name, that type of high emotion is hardwired pretty quickly to the consumer of that content. So whether you delete that video later or you say you're sorry when you're sober, that doesn't take away the damage that possibly incurred. We would all make mistakes. Lord knows <laughs> I've got a Santa Claus list full of them. But the difference being, if I've made a mistake, not only do I learn from that mistake, but I immediately change my behavior. And as I'm consuming a Canada's Pinball podcast over the years, Two or three times a year, we will receive such behavior quickly followed by deleting all evidence that it happened so that only your true hardcore target audience intakes that information and then immediately followed with a quick apology. Oftentimes, I was drunk. I'm sorry. Look, you know, you can't tell me you've not done made a bad decision when you're drunk. And, and many of us can say we have, but the boy can cry wolf only so many times. But when behavior becomes patterned to this point, apologies are no longer acceptable. The only thing acceptable is action. Last week, during this intoxicated rant that Canada had, I was brought up numerous times. My home for sale was brought up with, you know, information to where my family and I live. He was talking of, of my financials. There were links in his chat with his strongest supporters discussing this. I had people, we were, my wife and I are selling our home, and I've had some of, you know, some of the, the strong followers he has linking other people on our home for sale, the, the page linking others to our home and our information to keep up with what Canada is talking about. This is public information. I mean, it's doxing-esque, but it, that's not the big deal here. I mean, it's, you, know, you got to do is Google it. It's out there. But call me crazy if I feel a little bit weirded out by or scared by the fact that myself, my family are being brought up in a live public conversation fueled with hate and anger and done so in a way to put a spotlight on us as the cause of conflict when we have or had nothing to do with any of the complaints being made. I'm speaking on my platform because I'm trying to do so in a fair way that while I don't want to talk about this, I'm choosing to talk about this because I'm saying it's, it's making myself and my wife uneasy. We've been through a lot this year and adding additional stress and feelings of unease and possible safety issues, we just don't need it. I've said before, it's not so much Chris Coolers that I'm worried about. Pattern behavior, I, I, I can predict. I'm more concerned with Maybe some of you listening right now that are so enmeshed in the narratives, in the toxicity, I can't predict your behavior. 
I don't know you. And it only takes one person to try to be a hero for someone like Kaneda that they may look up to. It only takes one person to make that quote unquote, just a mistake while I was drunk for my entire world to be gone. So I understand some of you listeners, this is a hobby for you. And I want it to be the most gratifying, entertaining, fun-filled hobby ever. I don't want, as someone whose livelihood is around pinball, I don't want you to have to worry about this kind of stuff. It doesn't affect your life, sure, but it affects mine. And I just ask that you're cognizant of that and you don't brush that off as if it is everyone's hobby. For some people, it is their lives. This is supposed to be fun. This drama, playground behavior, spatting back and forth. I'm encouraging you to realize that that type of quick blanket that you throw over something may be encouraging it. We don't need this type of behavior. I want it to be a hobby for everybody, but it can only be that way if if people are safe. You know, Chris sells negativity. He boasts about getting leaked information. He pokes at content creators in general, just not for being his perception of as good as he is creating podcasts. Us content creators, we try to bite our tongue. You know, it it is what it is. But other things, at this point, I'm in a position to speak out against. And that's where I'm at today. I'm tired and no longer will I accept this type of behavior towards myself or to others. When he calls for the termination of industry employees, marketing employees of Stern Pinball, of Jersey Jack Pinball, he publicly calls for their job terminations. That behavior is unacceptable. That behavior is disgusting. And the irony of all of it is him doing so live from his place of business, his place of employment, a marketing firm. Chris said in a recent live stream that his employer was all in on himself in the pinball industry and the content he creates. I hope that that is merely a fabricated statement by himself because I don't know any company that would be okay with an employee from their property, their building, calling for the job terminations of another fellow marketer. And at the end of the day, just like this podcast, we don't have to listen. But keep in mind that doesn't make it go away. I can turn my cheek to a live stream. I can turn my cheek to a podcast. But it doesn't mean that I'm any safer. It doesn't mean I'm shielded. The only way for it to stop is for Chris to stop the behavior. Many of you support him, not only by consuming his content, but by paying him. And look, you can, you can rationalize that all you want. I'm only paying for the rumors that he gives. I'm only paying for the entertainment. Damn it, you're paying for his content. And his content many times is harmful to other people. That's where I talked about that blanket. No longer should you pull the wool over your eyes for your own selfish entertainment purposes. There is a line there, people, and I have no issue with someone supporting what they believe in, whether it be audio consumption or monetary fulfillment. But don't try arguing with me that by doing so, you get to pick and choose what you're supporting. That's garbage. And I will leave the somber pinball market trends with this. Moving forward, no one should be quiet about rhetoric that wants to minimize behavior during an intoxicated state. There are many of you listening and people you love, many women in the world that have been affected, who have been harmed, who have lived in fear simply because a man had one too many. That shit's got to stop. That behavior is unacceptable. That behavior is often misconstrued by its strongest supporters. This isn't cancel culture. I can't stand that shit either. This is humanity. This is morality. This is right from wrong. It is pretty easy to dissect. That's why I'm speaking out on it on my platform that you can choose or choose not to listen to now or in the future. But it's important to me. And this silly little hour to two hour show every week, every other week is my way of not only informing and entertaining, but to grow from. And I just hope that with the many listeners that we have, some of you can grow along with me. For most of you, it is just a hobby. I want it to continue just being a hobby. But never forget that behavior is behavior, no matter where it happens. And ladies and gentlemen, that was this week's Pinball Market Trends. I do truly appreciate your time. Let's close it out, Dennis. How can people get a hold of you? 
Easiest way is to email eclecticgamerspodcast at gmail.com or go to facebook.com slash eclecticgamerspodcast. Use Messenger tool. I check those regularly. And you've been on fire with watches with Dennis. Go check that out. Follow, subscribe to that as well. you got another this or that tot coming out, don't you? Oh, tots. Tots for days. Got tot coming up on Thursday. Tots are hot. Live tot. We do the polls live. We do it only on YouTube so I can do the polls. And I think you teased a little bit of a pinball sprinkle in this next episode. Mm, I've got one. Oh, I only did it on our private uh, TPN Discord. But since you've leaked confidential Sorry. messages. Shit. Yes. I actually, uh, there will be a matchup that will involve a pinball machine as one of the choices. Ooh. I've got so many guests who are pinball people that it's like, oh, I might as well. You gotta go check. Actually, that I had out a listener right request it too, so it's like, you gotta okay. go check that out. You can check out straight down the middle. We've got some fun, exciting stuff coming up. That's more official uh, in the coming. I guess in the coming months, it's going to be released. We also have some Halloween themed uh, pinball content coming up in the month of October for straight down the middle and flipping out pinball. If you're ready for a brand new pinball machine or a used pinball machine, some pinball accessories or whatnot, arcade games, you name it, we got it over at flipping out pinball. Product showcase this week, I'm going to say it, all the premiums that we have in stock because come January 1st, those damn things are going to go up $700. Why not buy what we have in stock now for the price it is right now? Mandalorian premium, Rush premium. Why are you going to pay more money January 1st? Get it now. Buy, buy, buy! Put it in a storage for, for Christmas, but buy it now. Save some money. Oktoberfest Classic we do have in stock. Mandalorian Pro and Premium, like I said. Rush is in stock. Star Wars Pro, I think I even have some premiums coming. Get the get the old price now. Led Zeppelin Pro and premiums. Get the old price. Cactus Canyon Remake SEs, we do still have some in stock. Every time we get those things in, they're like, oh, see you later, Godzilla Pro. I'll see you later, Cactus Canyon. They're in and they're out. Toy Story 4 LE and CE, we still have spots available for that. GNR LE, we have some pre-owned ones there, as well as a Mando Pro pre-owned. Iron Maidens, I'm going to list it. Follow us on Facebook. I'm going to list some used Iron Maiden Pros. And that thing ain't getting made till next year, so you know the price is going to shoot up on that. Elvira, 40th anniversary. Oh, so many people are tickling. They just tickle. They want it so bad, but they just don't want to pull the trigger. Bye, bye, bye. Maybe they will now that Elvira's have been bumped to next year. Here's your chance to have a brand new sparkly purple one with custom dagger shooter rod. You guys can order accessories, pre-order accessories from us. We're taking lists for bond topper that may be your shooter rod. We're taking lists for all of it. We didn't even talk about the LA side art, the black and white. I mixed on it. I think it'll look good though. Golden Tees 2022. Oh, CGC shaker motors. We haven't had those for a while. We have those back in stock now. So go buy, buy, buy on those. Buy, buy, buy. Escaleras, check us out at Expo. I think we're going to bring a couple. If you guys want to pre-order for a Chicago Pinball Expo, we will be there. I got to give a shout out to Flipping the Script Fundraiser for Autism. Loser Kid has partnered up with TPN and, and other media entities to be to be helping with that. So that big stream. So come check that. I think I'm. I have to do a guest spot. I don't. I'm interviewing somebody. Oh no! What a heavy burden for you. I don't know. I think I'm the headliner. I ain't gonna be there. I sent them some EGP stuff. Do you agree with me being uses. the headline of that show? Uh, no. Really? Who would you go with? Scott or Josh? Well, yeah, why not Scott and Josh? Really? Dual lead. They would yeah. be a bigger headline than me? Well, I mean, more people like them. Sell, sell, sell! You're being nice now, which I makes me think you really do truly believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Oh, uh, well, TVN last week is Pinball Party Podcast, episode five. Go check it out because it featured the, you, not the headliner, Zach Manny, but whatever, the tertiary headliner, the opening act, Triple Drain Pinball Podcast, episode 23, live from Klee Pin. TPN this week, a bunch of stuff's going on, so much that I, I can't even list. I do want to take the time at the end of the episode here, wishing a friend of the show, or Paul Pratzer of the Delaware Pinball Collective, a speedy recovery for a recent surgery uh, that he had. So wishing you the best, Paul. We're thinking about you. Get well soon. Get well soon. And until next fortnight, maybe. Maybe I'll do mm-hmm. one next week. I don't know. For Dennis mm-hmm. Creasel, I'll always be your headliner, Pushy. Zach Minnie. I always say, just remember, if you, if you can't shoot the lamps anymore, just go for the... <laughs> and to always practice safe pinball. And just remember, the true media is right here. Have a great week, everyone. A person is a person, no matter where they're at. Isn't that a fucking... I think it's a Horton Hears the Who. Or no, no matter how small. That's what... 
Yay. So you got my Dr. Seuss tropes mm -hmm. going You're here. You're seussing it up. But you know what I say. This is all a bunch of caca. <laughs> Bimbo bark caca. Caca market trends. Caca. Um, I, I, I can't do that one with the, with the <laughs> opener. <clears throat> it's time for Pimbo Market Trends. Caca. There you go. It's like a brand new damn game, The Mandalorian. New season's going to come out. Everybody's going to have a bone for The Mandalorian. Wood, wood. Pick it up, pick it up. A wimp, a wimp, a wimp, a wimp, Shoot the center wimp. Over and over again. Yes. Sorry. Oh, middle Orient. Pimba! Market trends. Black lung. The rasp Pop. hits me. You've been mining. You've been mining. You've been mining. You've been mining the spinal taps too much, Pop. <laughs> about to get a fucking spinal tap on the sixth of October. Mm, about <clears throat> time you got that back fixed. <clears throat> Some black and blue. Damn, man, tickled me like Craig Bobby tickles his wife. <laughs> Poor Joel. <laughs>